This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Catonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. Now this week we're going to talk about the Egyptian goddess Bast, who's also known as Bastet or Ubaste, um, or Iluros if you want to look at the Greek name, which um, of course we will talk about all of these things. Now Bast was a special request from somebody. Um, I did get a number of requests after doing deities like Tawaret and Sekhmet to please do more Egyptian um, goddesses, and she was specifically mentioned. Now Bast it wouldn't be one I would generally think of for the dark feminine except that, you know, when you, when you actually do go back in her history, much like Tawaret and uh, some of, you know, uh, these, these other um, female deities, there is definitely an ancient, very ferocious aspect to her. So there, there is a side of Bast that is, that, that is definitely what one might call dark feminine. Um, now, there's, there's a lot of different associations. And like a lot of Egyptian deities, you see that over time, over the different periods of Egyptian history that the that the deities, not only the deities role, but perhaps their names, perhaps their associations, or even some of their myths may shift depending on, you know, who who the other primary deities are of the time. Uh, just like there are multiple creation myths in ancient Egypt, uh, again, depending on which, you know, whether you're talking about Old Kingdom, whether you're talking about New Kingdom, whether you're talking about uh, the Ar- Armana period, you have all of these um, different uh, phases in which these these deities may have taken on uh, different roles, and of course, certainly once you have the Greeks and the Romans coming to Egypt, uh, you see the the syncretism. You see them taking on aspects of uh, either Greek or Roman deities as well. So Bast is really no exception to this. So what are the main facts about her that we need to know? Well, first of all, she's a cat goddess, which very much appeals to me. Anybody who knows me knows that um, I feel that cats are perfect creatures that do no wrong, even when they're little jerks. Um, I had, uh, I've had cat, I had cats for years, um, but when once my last uh, kitty passed away, um, I didn't I haven't adopted new ones because, as you may notice, I tend to travel a lot, and I just don't think it's fair to adopt an animal and then leave it alone for six months. So, um, so I haven't had a new animal. Next time, next time I finally settle down, uh, then I will probably adopt another cat. I've had up to four, um, but I, you know, but they're they're absolutely my favorite creature, uh, hands down. So, um, so so Bast is a is a deity whom I definitely have something of a certainly an affection or affinity for. Uh, now, who is she in Egyptian mythology? Well, we see her as the daughter of Ra, although in some versions she's the daughter of Isis and Osiris. And again, that has to do with when, you know, Osiris becomes a kind of, assumes a kind of uh, primacy. And uh, th- that would be more in the Greek period when there was an attempt to compare Bast to the goddess Artemis or to Diana, um, which again, I'll talk about. Uh, so she's the sister of Sekhmet. She's considered to be the wife of Ta. And the mother of either um, uh, you, you, the names either Mihos or Mahas was a lion-headed deity. Um, is is considered to be she's considered to be his mother. Uh, she was often also considered to be the mother of the pharaoh in in certain versions. Certainly, when you're looking back at the the old pyramid texts, that seems to be her role. Um, and uh, she just as Sekhmet was con- uh, associated with the noonday sun, and she is connected to Sekhmet. I mean, that's her sister. But they also seem to be aspects of each other, because Sekhmet, if you recall, is another lion-headed deity. And Bast, by the way, even though she often is shown in the form of a cat, like you'll actually see statues of cats, like with earrings, and you know, and you people say, "Oh, that's a Bast statue." Uh, not necessarily, because the Egyptians, you know, revered cats in the way um, I think there were some scholars that had compared it. And you know, this this may be speculative, but there does seem to be this idea that the Egyptians worshipped cats or or revered cats in the way that uh, people in India revere cows. Um, they they're very special, and more than likely, this is because cats <clears throat> have a role in you know getting rid of vermin. Um, you know, you know, the way that they can, they kill rats and mice and, um, other things that could be a pest to the crops. They are then therefore considered to have this kind of protective role. Um, and in fact, um, 
Bast is considered to be of particular importance because on the Ra's night journey, okay, the sun god, as we know, he travels the, the sky in his bark during the day. And then at night, he is in, uh, you know, travels through the underworld uh, in that the death mode where he is pursued by the serpent um, Apophis or Apep. And <clears throat> it's said that uh, Bast or Bastet uh, is, is the uh, cat goddess who actually protects Ra from, uh, from Apep or will slay Apep. And now that also connects Bast to another deity uh, called Mao. <laughs> Funny, very similar to Meow, right? Um, <clears throat> Mao is considered to be the divine <clears throat> cat as aspect of Ra. And similarly, there's also a connection between Bast and another deity called Mafdet, who is a goddess, of, one of the first feline deities in Egypt, probably the first, and is associated, similar to um, Mahat and uh, Thoth, as being associated with justice. And you'll see that all of that ties into the image of Bast that we end up having. Okay, so where, where do we see her as, as starting from? Well, the, the oldest texts that refer to her, of course, would be the pyramid texts. Those would be the ones um, in, in the pharaoh's tombs. And these associate Bast with the king of Egypt as his nursemaid and his protector. Um, and, you know, and, and in this role, we, hear, we see the idea of, um, let's see, the, there's, a, uh, there's a name that they, that they give. Um, I'm trying, I'm actually, what I'm actually looking for here is the, the actual pyramid text. Um, let's see, let me find it. Yes. Okay. This is what I'm looking for in my notes. Uh, in the pyramid text, the heart of the deceased is described as being like that of Bastet. Um, when the deceased monarch ascends and lifts himself to the sky. And it indicates that, uh, this is the, uh, new world encyclopedia. They say, you know, that this reference is derived from the goddess's mythic association with Ra, um, and it says, this association with the sun god is further demonstrated in an additional passage where the deceased pharaoh appeals to the cat goddess as his mother. Uh, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the goddess is mentioned in what is known as the negative confession. I think I've mentioned that there were <clears throat> formulae that the dead were, you know, that the pharaoh was supposed to recite to show that they, um, you know, have innocence, you know, in death that they, they are, their heart is pure enough to, to pass into these other realms. And it says, specifically, the soul avers, Hail Bast, who comes forth from the secret place, I have not dealt deceitfully. And hail thou, who dost stride backwards, who comest forth from the city of Bast, uh, I have not set my lips in motion against any man. And it says, as seen here, the goddess is associated with plain dealing and honesty, perhaps due to the symbolic relationship between humans and felines in Egyptian society. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. And of course, again, if we look back to this idea of uh, Bast as being connected to Mafdet, the, this uh, justice deity, this old uh, cat justice deity, then um, then we see how Bast uh, ends up being connected with uh, avenging wrongs and protecting those um, who have been dealt with deceitfully or who do something dishonest. Um, now, so this is, so that's one version of her. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit, um, Herodotus is the one who tells us the most about her worship in the city of Bubastis, uh, and, and her rituals and ceremonies and what her temple was like. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit, but, um, her, yeah, she, her role as this, this, um, she has this role as defender of the innocent and, but in the coffin texts, we see her as a, uh, you know, the there, there's there's references to the slaughterers of Bast, and uh, this is actually a reference to plague. Okay, so the idea is that um, you know cats actually are supposed to keep plague away, but very this is where she is very similar to the Greek Artemis, in that she is you know while the while the cat is said to control plague, you know either displeasing the cat or getting rid of the cat or you know killing the cat in some fashion. Um, brings plague, okay? So when when you started to have this Greek overlay of religion in Egypt, you know, probably around the Ptolemaic period and, and you know, later when the Romans are there, uh, you have this idea of... Uh, there. So, okay, so being if she's associated with Artemis, then there becomes this idea that she is part of a twin, just as uh, Artemis's twin brother is the god Apollo, Okay, and both of them, both Artemis and Apollo, are bringers of plague. Uh, whatever else their associations, we of course know that Artemis is associated with the hunt, 
And in some, you know, later versions, she tends to have an association with the moon um, and certainly with chastity. And Apollo, we see as being a deity of, you know, uh, oracle, prophecy, light, you know, civilization. But both of them are also bringers of plague. Um, every, every Greek tragedy that you see from Oedipus to, you know, uh, even the Iliad, it's just there. Everything starts with the plague sent by Apollo. Right. But his sister Artemis also could bring plague. And uh, so they had, you know, often to children as well. It was kind of like a violent death in, in children kind of a theme. And Bast was, similarly, in the coffin texts, Bast is seen as a bringer of plague. And it was said that if one um, cast certain spells or did certain magic, that um, where one declared oneself a son of Bastet, okay, then uh, you could potentially be protected from plague, that you are not going to, the plague is not going to harm you because you are a son of Bastet. So, um, you know, appealing to her as, as a mother figure, which is actually not uncommon with dark feminine figures. When you have very scary dark feminine figures, uh, you see this in Tantra as well, where you have this idea of appealing to these terrifying aspects as mother in some way. And uh, that, this, that if, they, if they start to see you as their child, that they will, you know, assume a protective role rather than um, a destructive one. So, uh, so with ba- so it is with Bast. Now, later on, it seems that her her role split. Um, oh, and and actually, okay, with relation to the twin thing, this probably led to a later story that suggested that Bast was the twin sister of Horus. Okay, because Horus ended up having more of these uh, Ap- Apollonic associations. Okay, uh, she he was you know, Horus of course is the is the popular hero. He's the son of Ra. Um, so therefore, is that association with the sun, as Apollo later becomes associated with the sun, um, and so so you have this, um, you know, th- this idea of Bast as being the, you know, associated with this idea of the eye of Ra. Um, we we tend to see so again, she tends to be associated with the morning sun, the eastern sky, the sun rising is usually associated with Bastet, just as her sister Sekhmet is associated with the noonday sun. And um, so, but but later on, what we see is this this aspect of Bastet as a, as a plague bringer, as one who is a slaughterer, uh, ends up being tempered in a way. Then you know Sekhmet becomes more associated with that violence, and Bastet becomes associated with more with the domestic cat, with a cat who is um, who is gentler, kindler, kindler, <laughs> kinder. Wow. Um, how many coffees have I had? Only two. Uh, it, it's um, how it's the it is this gentler, gentler um, version of her that you know that, that that she is seen more as a as a protector. Now, there's another aspect of Bast uh, that has to do with connected with a, a musical instrument called the sistrum, and the sistrum is um, as it's been pointed out. Um, I have uh, looking at Murray Hope's book. I was I, I was. I was reminded of this. Uh, Murray Hope is the one who developed the way of cartouche system. Anybody who knows about my the readings that I do, like I do tarot and other stuff, but cartouche is one of the main things I use. And um, this was a system developed by Murray Hope back in, I don't know, 70s or the 80s. It, there, it's a pretty much out of print and hard to come by now. But I do have her original book. And she has this to say about Bast and with regard to the system. So I wanted to just read that to you from here because it's um, cause I think it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, it says the sistrum is a musical instrument shaped like an onk, with four bars representing the four elements fixed across the loop head. These bars, sometimes equipped with brass discs, fit loosely so when the instrument is shaken, they act like a kind of tambourine. The Greek biographer and philosopher Plutarch mentioned the instrument in some detail. The sistrum, he told readers, also shows that existent things must be shaken up and never have cessation from impulse, but as it were be awakened and agitated when they fall asleep and die away. For they say they turn aside and beat off Typhon, or Set, with Sistra, signifying that when corruption binds nature fast and brings her to a stand, then generation frees her and raises her fight by death by means of motion. Okay, so the Sistrum, in addition to having this kind of musical quality to it, because, you know, it's obviously, you use tambourines, they make a certain type of, of percussion, a type of music, right? And indeed, Plutarch, there, she, Murray Hope goes on to talk about it in, in regard to Platonic theory on the harmony of the spheres and the way in which the shaking of the sistrum brings back things back into rhythm or back into balance in some fashion. 
Now, where you would see um, the depictions of Bast show her carrying the sistrum. So there's this idea of motion. Now, that that's very reminiscent. And again, this is not to say that there's a historical connection here, because I'm not saying that. But it does remind me of the idea of um, the way in which Shakti is that active principle. It's more like an active feminine principle that, that puts things in motion rather than leaving them at a standstill. Uh, and that, that that's just also curious, too, when I think about the connections between her sister Sekhmet and the goddess Kali. Now, again, I'm, I'm making no assertion that there is some historical connection between um, you know, ancient Indian worship of Kali or Shiva or anything else with ancient Egypt. I mean, if, if there is such a connection, we, we don't know about it. Um, but, you know, but, but it's just interesting to me that there's that similarity. Um, that's about as much as I would say about it because, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to imply that there's a historical connection where there isn't one, but it's, um, in the way that it, you know, on a more, I guess we'll call it an archetypal level, the way, that the dark feminine is portrayed this way, or the way in which these stories similarly play out. Um, because in this case, you talk about Typhon or Set, you're talking about a deity that brings storms. So in that sense, brings chaos. Now, Set um, is... You know, we, we tend to see Set nowadays, like a lot of a lot of these kind of um, dark deities, as kind of, as being um, a negative, as being like a devil figure, right? Um... Typhon or Set is seen as kind of an enemy, an enemy of people or a bringer of chaos. Though we, of course, forget that Set was one of those who was defending Ra against his, um, against the night demons that threatened him uh, on his night journey. Uh, Set one, was one of his defenders. And we also um, tend to forget that, that chaos and storms and things like that do have a certain place in life. Um, they mean they may not be pleasant for us, we may prefer that they don't affect us, but they do. Um, and the more you're able to um, embrace that kind of unpredictability, the better off you are. Um, although, of course, if you're under, you know, <clears throat> if, if there's that imbalance, if you're under if you're under too much of an assault, then obviously there's a need to, to protect and to push back, right? To, to, to set the boundary. Um, and that that's another interesting aspect of not only Bastet, but, you know, Sekhmet. And then also, the, the similarly related is Hathor. Hathor also has a connection to both Sekhmet and to Bastet. Probably more to Sekhmet, but um, there's, they all, all of these uh, female deities, um, they tend to have a protective role. They have some kind of underworld role. Now, Bastet does not have a primary underworld role. Um, again, she she is portrayed sometimes as being connected with Mao, the, the cat deity that um, that slays the, the serpent Apep. Um, but uh, but she's not somebody, say, who acts as a psychopomp, does not bring souls of the dead to the underworld. That's not generally considered to be Bastet's role. Um, she might be associated with that aspect of the soul called the Ba. Uh, that Her hieroglyph certainly uh, suggests that. Um, but it's, um, you know, so... It, but you have this idea of, of Bast as the... Um, you know, she's she's got this connection to, um, you know, she, so she's got this protective element, like you will also see with Isis, like you'll see with Nepethys, like you'll see with, um, uh, you know, like you'll see with you know, even Sekhmet, or you'll see with um, with Hathor. They all, all the female deities, Tawaret, they all have this, um, they have a terrifying aspect, but it's protective. So... And, you know, and in the case of Bast, we're seeing a deity that we associate with, with cats, but who was originally associated with lions, okay, again, like Sekhmet. Uh, and the lion, of course, has a very ferocious image. Um, one of the images you will see from certainly the Greek time period is the idea of Heracles and like the Nemean, the, the Nemean lion, uh, you know, having to overcome the power of that lion. Uh, and that... Uh, or if you look at the strength card in Tarot, where you have the woman who is um, shutting the lion's jaws, you have this idea of the lion as representing um, something the ferocious that could destroy you and rip you apart. But on the other hand, we also tend to associate lions with courage, okay, and with having, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, ha having the kind of um, the courage it takes to to face obstacles or to fight adversaries as we need to. 
Um, so again, you're back to this whole idea of them as being, you know, this kind of balancing force, um, when, when things become, you know, the, at the times when such force becomes necessary. Um, but the cat itself, I mean, when you think about cats, I mean, I think about all the cats that I've owned and all the ones that I see wandering around, uh, the ones especially who do hunt. Um, my own cat, the last one I had was a, ugh, he was a, you know, he, he occasionally would catch something, but typically he would catch a mouse, like hit a vein. And then, you know, I'd, I'd wake up to blood all over the walls because this, ugh, and then he would, you know, I think he did it every now and again, just to prove to me that he could hunt. Cause I almost looked at him and went, you're useless. This is a cat who would, um, sit there. A mouse would actually come out from under my sink and be sitting there eating the cat's food. And I'm like, there's a mouse eating your food. And the cat would just sit there and stare at me, stare at my finger. I was like, God. And then, then the mouse would finally run away, and then the cat would turn around and look at me and kind of sniff around and go, you know, I think there might have been a mouse here. I'm like, God. You know, he just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the, the, he was a little dim, I guess is what you might say. But the poor cat did actually, uh, when I'd adopted him, did have a head injury, so that might have had something to do with it. I shouldn't, shouldn't pick on the poor, poor kitty. But he was, but every now and again, he would stalk and kill a mouse, and he usually liked to try to bring them alive into my bed, or he would, um, yeah, he would somehow catch them with his tooth in such a way that I would wake up and go, oh God, you know, it was, um, it was rather grisly. Um, so in any case, not to diverge into that, but the point being about when cats hunt, cats have a certain amount of stealth to them. They're not, um, they, you know, they, they can jump and directly attack, but that's not often their method. Usually they stalk their prey. So, you know, so there is this idea, this is this very warlike image where on the one hand you want attacks with uh, very direct force but on the other hand also uses strategy and, and tactic and if you ever watch a cat like getting ready to to fight and to spring um, you look at the way the legs are you look at the way that they, you know people talk about the butt wiggle you know that they do they just they the way that they um, their eyes are and the way that their body arches itself um, before they spring in for a kill um, you know, and it depends on, <clears throat> on how good they are at it, but, uh, and female cats, by the way, uh, in case you don't know this, uh, are much better hunters than male cats. Usually the females actually teach the males how to hunt. Uh, that's, that's, you know, the way it is. I, I remember at one time I owned, how many cats did I have? I had, was I up to four? I think I was up to four. I think it was when I had moved into my apartment, um, in, you know, when I first, um, got divorced. <clears throat> and I ended up with all four cats. And we had one uh, female um, called uh, Autumn. She was beautiful, torty cat. And she had, uh, and I had two, I had, I had two boys and I had another girl. Okay. Um, and there was a, uh, there was a mouse that managed to get into the apartment. And um, the two boys were, you know, the, the, the female cat, you know, Autumn, she jumped on it and she caught it and she brought it over in front of the boys, like saying like, okay what do you do next? And they were just like slapping it. <laughs> like, it was, it was a funny thing. And of course the mouse got away and went under my bed. I said, yeah, thanks. So then it became, if you ever watched Tom and Jerry, this kind of scene of them, you know, running around the house until eventually I think I caught the mouse and brought it outside and they all just looked at me like I was a traitor. But, um, and then the mouse got back in and eventually got killed. So, you know, it's not, <laughs> Hey, I tried, but, um, it's yeah, but but there's this this uh, but you have the females who who are definitely the better hunters there. Um, so okay, but looking at Bast, let's let's look at her aspect um, with connected to the system and connected to uh, you know this uh, to her worship. So at this point, I think I want to talk a little bit about um, Herodotus and what Herodotus says about Bast and, and Bastet. Um, oh, one important thing I'm not mentioning here is the, her name. Okay. There's, there's not, again, like a lot of these names, there's not an agreement on what the name actually means. Some think it has, you know, there's some, there's some translations that literally try to translate her name as having to do with the soul of Isis, but the most common, um, associates it with an ointment jar. Okay. And the Greek word alabaster, B-A-S-T in there, alabaster, which is a kind of, uh, you know, alabaster is usually, al, you know, <clears throat> the, that's, you know, the associated with the whiteness, you know, this kind of, this white, um, this ointment. Um, alabaster is, 
you know, is there's you know, may have to do be connected to this um, kind of ritual ointment or whatever that might have been. Well, first of all, ones that would have been kept in the in the tombs uh, with the with the pharaoh and perhaps you know with others who were buried. You know, this idea of having the ointment jar and certainly that ointment is part of the anointing of the body uh, when it's being prepared for death. Um, but the, so Bastet's name seems to be connected to the ointment jar. Um, so. You know, and, and again, that, that may be in, in connection with the idea of preserving or embalming the body uh, in connection with having a house, you know, for the ba or for the soul. Um, that's, that's purely speculative on my part, but um, it's, it's very much, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, they're, 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 that does seem to be the most consistent agreement on what her name means, but, but, it's un- but you need to understand that that's not necessarily the the final word on it there's still some disagreement about that <clears throat> um so okay so in looking at this um i'm just looking through some of my notes here yeah she was known as also the lady of slaughter i had mentioned but also the lady of dread okay that, these were some of her earlier epithets uh and again that may have had to do with her uh, bringing of justice um so she is, uh, yes, and I want to talk about, um, her cult center is at Bubastis in Lower Egypt, and I said it was one of the most, the richest and the most luxuriant cities in Egypt, um, and have their bodies of their dead cats were interred there. I mean, if your cat died, I mean, that was, that was an occasion for mourning. I think people shaved their eyebrows, um, and it was, um, there, yeah, there was, there was, there was a whole ceremony for, you know, it, you know, for your, you know, your dead cat. So people today who, you know, have their cats interred in these uh, pet cemeteries and stuff uh, would, would not have been so weird then. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they have, okay, so I have this um, this tale. What I'm trying to find is my um, my Herodotus quote here. I have I have so many, there's so many things on her and there's so many notes. Um, I want to make sure I find it. Ah, here we go. So here's what Herodotus says about Bast. Uh, So he's talking first about her temple in um, Bubastis. Save for the entrance, it stands on an island. Two separate channels approach it from the Nile, and after coming up the entry of the temple, they run round it on opposite sides, each of them 100 feet wide and overshadowed by trees. The temple is in the midst of the city, the whole circuit of which commands a view down into it. For the city's level has been raised, but that of the temple has been left as it was from the first, so it can be seen into from without." A stone wall, carven with figures, runs round it. Within it is a grove of very tall trees growing round a great shrine, wherein the image of the goddess. The temple is a square, each side measuring a furlong. A road, paved with stone, of about three furlongs length, leads to the entrance, running eastward through the marketplace, towards the temple of Hermaeus. This road is about 400 feet wide with, and bordered by trees reaching to heaven. Okay, so sounds quite um, dramatic. Um, <clears throat> and there's also, um, let's see, he, they mentioned, says the description by Herodotus, um, and several Egyptian texts suggest that water surrounded the temple on three out of four sides, forming a type of lake known as an Isheru, not too dissimilar from the, uh, surrounding temple of the mother goddess Mut in Karnak at Thebes. These lakes were typical components of temple devoted to a number of lioness goddesses who are said to represent the one original goddess, Bastet, Mut, Tefnut, Hathor, and Sekhmet and came to be associated with sun gods such as Horus, Ra, and the Eye of Ra. Each of them has to be appeased by a specific set of rituals. One myth relates that a lioness, fiery and wrathful, was cooled down by the water of the lake, transformed into a gentle cat. So maybe this is the um, the significance of the, you know, the water is, water is, you know, dealing with perhaps the fiery aspect of, of the, the feline. Um, so, let's see, the... Um, I have another note on her, on her festivals, um, down here. It's, uh, I've got, okay, worship of Bastet. Yeah, it's, um, okay. God says, um, this is, this is from, um, this is her, uh, primarily at, uh, Bubastis, tutelary position at Saqqara and elsewhere. Um, this is a writing from Wilkinson. This is from the World History Encyclopedia. The goddess's popularity grew over time. In the late period in Greco-Roman times, she enjoyed great status. The main cult center of this deity was the city of Bubastis, Telbasta, in the eastern delta, 
And although only the outlines of the temple now remain, Herodotus visited in the 5th century BCE and praised it for its magnificence, which is what I just read to you. The festival of Bastet was also described by Herodotus, who claimed it was the most elaborate of all the religious festivals of Egypt, with large crowds participating in unrestrained dancing, drinking, and revelry. Okay. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> so here's the here's what the, his description of the festival. This is Herodotus. When people are on their way to Bubastus, they go by river, a great number in every boat, men, women together. Some of the women make noise with the rattles or the sistrums. Others play flutes all the way while the rest of the women and the men sing and clap their hands. As they travel by river to Bubastus, whenever they come near any other town, they bring their boat near the bank. And some of the women do as I've said, while some shout mockery of the women of the town. Others dance and others stand up and lift their skirts. They do this whenever they come alongside any riverside town. But when they have reached Bubastus, they make festival with great sacrifices. More wine is drunk and in this feast than in the whole year besides. It is customary for men and women, but not children, to assemble there in the number of 700,000, as the people of the place say. Okay, that's interesting. So there's, there's actually kind of a uh, Dionysian element to these rituals. First of all, um, not only the debauchery with drinking of wine, which we also associate with Sekhmet for different reasons. Cause, um, and, and this, by the way, when I think about the, the ritual of calming the lion with you know, water, turning the lion into a domestic cat, you know, similarly, um, in the story of Sekhmet, she's given beer dyed red, to drink to um, to stop her, you know, being on a bloody ramp, bloodthirsty rampage. Uh, again, making it very similar to Kali rampaging and destroying the universe. So again, there's this idea of, uh, or if we think about uh, the three-headed dog that guards the underworld, uh, Kerberos. Um, how how is Kerberos usually placated? Usually, he's given a a sop or like some kind of a, a bread soaked in wine, so that they'll he'll eat it and then fall asleep. So the idea is that the wine is something that is placating to the ferocious aspect. Um, on the other hand, we also know that wine can sometimes fuel people, and it also, um, you know, frees up your speech. You're, you're not, you know, the drunkenness in vino veritas, as they say. It's, it's the idea that in wine there is truth, and so then oftentimes you will say things when you're drunk that you might not say, that you would be more circumspect about when you're sober. So there's definitely this sense of unrest, you know, lack of, you know, unrestrained by social constraints, freedom, and the role that women play here. And of course, the fact that they're showing their genitals. I mean, there, there, there could be a fertility aspect to this potentially, but nonetheless, there is this sensuality. So there's very much this um, <clears throat> um, catonic kind of revelry where, you know, uh, enjoying the fruits of the earth, enjoying wine, enjoying sex, um, and also the idea of mockery or humor. If you recall from Dionysus, um, Dionysus is uh, able to, um, you know, they, they, during the Dionysus festivals, one was allowed to go and, you know, uh, you, you could make a mockery of, you know, the government. You could, you could say certain things. You could, you know, you, you could go around and sort of harass people a little bit. It was, it was a way in which... Um, and you remember, this is when satires were written and things like that. There, there was the idea that one did not have to um, check their speech uh, or that one, you know, one could just be open and be whatever they were, as animalistic as that might be. Um, you know, th this idea of having to put on that civilized veneer has gone away. So, um, so again, we see this, this is associated with Bastet. And again, the shaking of the sistrum. Um, Murray Hope has an interesting thing to say about that in her book. Now, you can, you know, it, it, again, it's an interpretation. But in her discussion of the legend of Bast, this is what she says. Um, now, she says Bast was originally known as Pasht, um, which may be in a, a pronunciation um, of that. She said, the daughter of Ra, in legend that she defended her aging parent against his only real enemy, the serpent Apep, a representation, okay, of, of, of darkness, Bast and the lion-headed goddess named Sekhmet were both referred to as daughter of Ra, indicating some confusion between the two identities in early days. In addition to her major symbol, the sistrum, Bast was allotted one of the divine eyes in the form of the Urias, which is the serpent. According to one version, she acquired this from her brother Horus, but the popular belief she was given charge of it by Ra for defending him against Apep. 
Although the Arias is considered to be the right eye and Horus eye the left, there's obviously some confusion as eyes were depicted under the Horus banner facing either way, which suggests that the ancient Egyptians themselves might have been unsure as to which was which. Although she can be traced back as far as 3000 BC, it's not until later times that Bast was acknowledged as sister of Horus and daughter of Isis and Osiris. So as I mentioned, as we get towards the uh, <clears throat> the Greek period, that's she ends up being conflated with that legend. Uh, she does not appear in the original Osiris myth, uh, yet Herodotus insists that secret information regarding the twinship was passed to him by Egyptian priests of the time. Now remember, this is 5th century BCE, and this is when Greece um, has a, you know, uh, there's there's some syncretism between that and Egyptian um, culture, who claimed it had been handed down through inner temple tradition since earliest days. The center of the worship of Bast was the city of Ubastus, and thanks to Herodotus, yeah, you have the vivid and generous account of her nature and rights. Uh, several theories have arisen regarding the origin of Bast. Um, <clears throat> they've also no- would noted how she was considered by some authorities to have been the daughter of Ra, but another school insists her oldest form was a lion-headed goddess named Tefnut, Horus being another or later version of Tefnut's twin Shu, the sky god. It is on account of this portrayal in lioness form she is no doubt confused with Sekhmet, who was designated as the warrior aspect of Hathor. Um, again, there are those who consider Sekhmet and Bast to be one and the same, with Bast representing the more domesticated aspect of the cat family, while others do not see Bast as an entity in her own right at all, but as a personalized anima or female aspect of Horus. Okay. It says, according to Herodotus, Bast was a happy and benign deity who brought good fortune, music, dance, and joy to all. Statues of cats are passed off as facsimiles of Bast, but this is incorrect. The cat was her sacred animal, and the people tended to see the goddess in every cat that walked past, but her original depiction as a royal lady or priestess with a cat's head. In addition to the symbols already discussed, her others were the Aegis and a basket containing kittens. That's a wonderful little symbol. Egyptians used pictorial symbology to convey the people, the, the principle, uh, nature and principle represented by a god or goddess. Bast expressed the qualities of the lion or cat family, beauty of movement, agility, strength, caution, fidelity to the pride, etc., which could also be interpreted at the spiritual level. She says, my own studies led me to believe Bast is an entity in her own right, her unique energies being encapsulated in the system. Whether or not one accepts Bast as the twin of Horus, um, anyone working with any form of Egyptian magic will be left with no doubt as to the affinity between these two principles. And she brings in, in the idea of Jung's uh, anima animus, where she says anima is feminine, of the personality animus is masculine. As long as these two factors remain in equipo- equipoise, all is well, but one should one or the other become overemphasized, the resulting imbalance will affect the persona or self-expression of the individual. Okay, so she's bringing in the idea of the sistrum and, and of the influence of Bast, as having this anima type quality in the same way that both Hathor and Sekhmet do, um, with again both benign qualities and ferocious ones. Um, you know, this the the total feminine, not not the one that's just um, associated with one thing or the other. Um, but we see this, we see her as having evolved this more benign role. We see this split off between between her and Sekhmet. Um, so you know, and so I what I what I find interesting about that is is the fact that she is um you know there's there's this idea of the sistrum as as kind of the shaking of the sistrum again as as plutarch says bringing about that motion that kind of shakti type motion and also as as being a balancing force between masculine and feminine it is this balancing force of the universe that um you know and again if we have this image of the lion that is cooled by water and becomes a domestic cat. Um, again, you have this kind of merging of fire and water that you might see in something like the temperance card in the tarot. You know, you have these two different elements that come together, and you actually do see this quite a lot in... Um, um, it, it, there's references to this in Orphic writings and in Zoroastrian writings as well. You have this idea of um, le, le, uh, le and et le feu, you know, the, the water and the fire. Um which are, are variously interpreted interpreted with regard to different deities, but you do kind of see that symbolism here with Bastet. Um, the last thing I'm going to tell you about today is there's a story that's associated. Now, it's not about Bast per se, but it is connected to her. And it is, it is you know, because there's very few stories directly about her. Um, but this is the tale of Setna and Tabubu. Now, this one I'm reading from the World History Encyclopedia because it's the most um, 
it seems to be the, the, the most, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? Um, it, it's the one that, that, that seems to have, you know, been taken from, um, the most, um, the sources that I consider to be the most credible, I guess let's put it that way. Um, okay. So the tale of Setna and Tabubu, which is part of the work known as the first Setna or Setna the first, is the middle section of a work of Egyptian literature composed in Roman Egypt history and held by the Cairo Museum in Egypt. The main character of the Setna tale is Prince Setna, um, uh, Kimwas, who is based on the actual prince and high priest of Ta, um, Kamweset, uh, which was 1281 to 1225 BCE, the son of Ramesses II. And um, this... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Kamweset, known as the first Egyptologist, was famous for his restoration and preservation efforts of ancient Egyptian monuments, and by the time of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which is, of course, the um, when you start to see Roman influence in Egypt, was greatly revered as a sage and magician. Although the story may be interpreted in different ways, Geraldine Pinch, who's a scholar who's written a lot about Bast, argues that it can be most clearly understood as an illustration of how Bastet punishes transgressors. In this story, young Prince Setna steals a book from a tomb, even after the inhabitants of the tomb beg him not to. Shortly after, he is in Memphis, near the Temple of Ta, when he sees a beautiful woman accompanied by her servants and lusts after her. He asks about her and learns her name is Tabubu, the daughter of a priest of Bastet. He has never seen any woman more beautiful in his life and sends her a note asking her to come to his bed for ten gold pieces, but she returns a counteroffer telling him to meet her at the Temple of Bastet in Saqqara, where she lives, and he will have all he desires. Setna travels to her villa where he's eager to get to the business at hand, but Tabubu has some stipulations. First, she tells him he must sign over all his property and possessions to her. He is so consumed with lust that he agrees to this and moves to embrace her. She holds him off, however, and tells him that his children must be sent for and also sign the documents agreeing to this, so there will be no problems with legal transference. Setna agrees to this also and sends for his children. While they are signing the papers, Tabubu disappears in another room and returns wearing a linen dress so sheer he can see every part of her body through it and his desire grows almost uncontrollable. With the documents signed, he again moves towards her, but no, she has a third demand. The children must be killed, so they will not try to renege on the agreement and embroil her in a long, drawn-out court bottle. Setna instantly agrees to this. His children are murdered, their bodies thrown in the street. Setna then pulls off his clothes, takes Tabubu, and leads her quickly to the bedroom. As he embracing her, she suddenly screams and vanishes, as does the room and villa around them, and Setna is standing naked in the street with his penis thrust into a clay pot. Um, the pharaoh comes by at this time, and Prince Setna is completely humiliated. Pharaoh informs him his children still live, everything he has experienced has been an illusion. Setna then understands he has been punished for his transgression in the tomb and quickly returns the book. He further makes restitution to the inhabitants of the tomb by traveling to another city and retrieving mummies buried there who were part of the tomb inhabitants' family so they can all be reunited in one place. Although scholars disagree who Tabubu represents, her close association with Bastet as the daughter of one of the goddess's priests makes a deity a very likely candidate. The predatory nature of Tabubu, once she has seen Setna, once she has Setna where she wants him, is reminiscent of the cat toying with the mouse. Geraldine Pinch concludes that Tabubu is a manifestation of Bastet herself, playing her traditional role of punisher of humans who have offended the gods. In this story, Bastet takes the form of a beautiful woman to punish a wrongdoer who has violated a tomb, but the story would also have been a cautionary to men who viewed women only as sexual objects so that they would never know whether they were actually in the presence of a goddess and what might happen should they offend her. Um, that's reminiscent of a statement of Crowley. <clears throat> be careful how you treat a beggar because they may turn out to be a king. Um, yeah, so it's the idea of, you know, revering the woman as a goddess and not simply as an object because, you know, the idea is you don't know when you're dealing with a goddess, but, you know, perhaps in a lot of senses, in certain sense, you always are. Um, so uh, so this is, this is an interesting story connected with Bast or Bastet. And... You know, and, and of course, in thinking about the theme of the cat toying with the mouse, um, I also makes me think of uh, the way in which, you know, which cats are cats are so alluring that we we let them get away with pretty much anything. I mean, if you are a cat person, if you're not a cat person, you're you're not gonna you'd be like, yeah, whatever. But as somebody who's a cat person, um, you know, my you know, cats can do all kinds of bad things, and you're just like, oh, you know, and you put up with it because you know they're a cat, and you know they're. They're perfect. So, um, so I think just in summary, we're seeing here this idea. We have this, um, um, 
you know, this this idea of her uh, dreadful and slaughtering aspect, her idea, her connection with Mao and um, uh, math debt and, you know, these these ancient deities that have to do with justice, but also as a protector of Ra, protector of the sun god uh, on his night journey. And later her, you know, her role as a protector of... Um, of households, and again, you know, the idea of cats as being the ones who kill vermin and, you know, preserve the crops and so forth. This is a, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's not, it's not, it's not hard to make that association, but but Bass certainly seems to be associated with that, and, you know, and we do know that cats held a very uh, special place. So Bast was a very important goddess. In fact, there is one other story about. Um, it was an invading army that drove a whole bunch of cats before it so that the Egyptians would not attack because the, the Egyptians were too fearful of actually hurting the cats, you know, and, and killing the cats. So they ended up surrendering, um, or at the very least being subdued. So, um, yeah, so, so it's interesting how we see the way that the cat iconography plays out and, and this, you know, the lion is becoming the symbol of something that is, um, both... Um, both ferocious, but also um, dealing with courage and grace. You know, it, it's a, when you're talking about the female line in particular, you are talking about something that is a vicious hunter, but also um, has, you know, certainly the domesticated cat is the is the calmer version and has these these kinds of qualities that, um, you know, that, that um, bring, bring prosperity, bring abundance, and bring happiness. Um you know, and, and the association with the Sistrum, again, there's there's this kind of um, Dionysian element there, you know, because you, you see her being celebrated with the drinking of wine and dancing and, you know, sexual kinds of connotations and the kind of mockery that people make and satire. It's with, so it's with this idea of freedom. And you can also look at the cat as, as a, we always talk about cats as being very independent, right? They're very, uh, they're very free. Um, although, again, every cat I've ever owned has been extremely clingy. But you know, there's, uh, you know, there's this idea of like, you know, dogs are high maintenance cats, you know, you can leave a cat for a week with food and it'll be fine. It doesn't care. Um, you know, so, so you see all of these qualities sort of represented in Bastet and like other Egyptian deities, as we move from the more archaic periods down into, um, the periods of Greek and Roman influence, um, as I'd mentioned, the Greeks have a, um, a cat also um, named for her. Um, what was the name that I, I, I want to say? Um, I, I almost remember the name off the top of my head. I, 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 I'm looking it up because I feel like I'm going to say it wrong. Um, um, Iluros, that's it. Yeah, I wanted to reverse two of the letters there in my mind. Uh, Iluros, which is, which is the Greek word for cat. But uh, this is an aspect, you know, this is Bast as, as associated with, with Artemis. So again, you have this this plague bringer. Uh, you have this deity that is, um, you know, that that can be ferocious. That is associated with killing the serpent that is going to attack the sun god, which again may be reminiscent of the cats killing the vermin that will perhaps destroy your crops and your livelihood. Um, but you know, but then you also have this other aspect that's almost like a Shakti thing. That, you know, Bastet, the, the system of Bastet as you know, keeping keeping the rhythm of the universe in motion. So, uh, very interesting subject, um, very interesting goddess, and thanks for the request to do um, this particular podcast. I'll just give my quick spiel and say goodbye. Um, I just want to say, you know, all my works at katonia.net. If you want to support my work, uh, please visit patreon.com slash katonia. I do do extra episodes during the month for the $5 level and above. And certainly, um, I try to give, you know, first access uh, to the podcast to um, to subscribers, and I give regular updates to subscribers. Um, and, uh, you know, as, <laughs> as if my life slows down, then hopefully I can, um, you know, add some more things. But um, I have a lot in the works at the moment, but, um, you know, probably as, as the autumn goes on, we'll, we'll see more of that. Uh, so there's that. Um, my private practice is at liminalreiki.com, which is uh, one-on-one stuff uh, that, that is connected to this work, but is more about personal coaching and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think, yeah. So with that, those are the those are the main things. Oh, yeah, and of course, social media, uh, Katonia Podcast, one word on Twitter and Instagram, 
two words on Facebook, and of course, it's just Katonia if you are watching on YouTube. Thanks so much again. Thank you to my wonderful patrons who are freaking amazing, and I'll see you in the next episode.